That is, she was getting, she was taking her master's degree over at Fuller Seminary over in California. COVID hit. She's doing, she's a therapist. So she's going to get her hours with church service, working with other therapists. And she basically said, dad, um, this isn't for me. I can't take on people's problems. I would rather come into the family business and give self happiness than uh, take on people's like things. So she's, she's, she's in line to train. She's been with us for a couple of years, full on as management owners for the last couple of years since, since COVID basically. So anyway, we're glad to have them both. They are teaching today's garden class. Here's the list you need to knock out before spring really gets going. So really in the next month, you should be doing these nine things. You're going to go over that. And, and, and we've got to, can I just mention one other thing? The uh, spring open house is, is next week. We've got our growers coming in. So the folks that make all these plants, they're actually creating a new color of rose. They're creating new, new life. It's kind of fun. They're, they're making the fertilizers, the mulch that we, we sell. They help us kind of figure out the recipes. They're coming next Saturday, and Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So uh, please join us. I don't know what the weather's going to be. It doesn't matter. We're throwing a party anyway, just because we're getting ready for spring. And then we're loading up the garden center for that. That's why you see so many plants. It's ridiculous. But we're gearing up for next weekend, spring open house. With that, let's give it up for Lisa. Yeah. Oh, that's good. So we've got a kind of a Friday. We're going to switch it up next week. Friday at 3 o'clock, we're going to have a, a special class just to introduce many of these, can we call it a plant happy hour, just kind of introducing some of the new plants. And then Saturday's class, this time next week, I'll actually have the growers come up. Some of them are really sharp. Some of them have not been out of the greenhouse for a year. But they talk about plants. They love talking Latin. They can go as deep as you want to go. So there'll be kind of two classes next week. One, the new plants on Friday at 3, kind of different. And then Saturday at 9.30, it's basically I'll be up here interviewing the, the head growers of these different companies. Anyway, that's thank you, Ken. Appreciate that. With that, give it up for Lisa and Mackenzie. Radios are working. Are yeah, they sure. testing? Can you hear us? Okay. Are we coming across? We're very quiet We're voices. Voices. So if you get where you can't hear us, just go, eh, and we'll try to talk louder. So this is my first class teaching with you. I haven't taught fun. McKinsey before, so it should be fun. I'm going to kind of let her take the lead. And if I feel like she missed something, there I'll, go. <laughs> I'll step on her toes. Uh, she knows her stuff. So yeah, Ken has the nine. I don't know why he didn't make it 10, but it's nine things you should do for spring. Um, and hopefully spring is here. Hopefully we're done with. <laughs> we're saying it is. <laughs> you know the great big snowstorms. We'll probably get. We will get some more cold weather. We are in the mountains, and we will get some more cold weather. It kind of fools you, where it gets nice and warm, and you start singing, and the birds start singing, and then it snows or it rains or we get freezing temperatures. So it's always something to be aware of here in the mountains. Don't be in a big hurry to put out your tomatoes. It is way too early. Unless you got that greenhouse, then you're in luck. Uh, but I'll let Kinsey get started. Oh, you got some. Yeah, handouts. so we're going to do three handouts, and uh, Ken Davis will send them kind of by Monday at the latest. Um, these are the sign up for those handouts. The first handout is our spring to do list. So Ken has made it that it, this is what we're going to send you is our spring to do list. So everything I'm talking about, we'll send it. We are also sending out a strawberry kind of handout. It talks about strawberries. We got some in, so we wanted to just give that to you guys. <laughs> Our little strawberries. I'll be your Vanna. Vanna. Right. <laughs> um, and then, uh, so those are the main ones. We got one more that I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's a good one. So those are the handouts. If you're part of the member or membership, it is not the same thing as signing up for these handouts. So if you don't sign up here, you will not get the handouts. Oh, oh, the veggie calendar. Yes. So planting, yeah. when to plant your vegetables and the times that we're sending out as well. I That's knew it was important. <laughs> okay. So let's get into it. So the first thing on the list is pruning. March is the time to do it. You have to do it by the end of March. Um, 
roses, li not lilacs, don't no, do that. No. Roses, uh, salvia, Russian sage, any of your vines, you wanna cut those back before the end of March is a good time to do it. Um, and, and So and, why she said that, because if you have lilacs, forsythia, rhododendrons, oh, all saying. those guys, do not prune those until they're done blooming. Because if you prune them now, you're going to prune off all those pretty blossoms and you won't have anything in the spring. Those of you that have landscapers that do your yard, don't let them prune those spring blooming things. Yeah. Uh, because you'll just lose all that bloom. That's what you planted them for is to enjoy that fragrance and the colors. So wait on those guys. Uh, but anything else, especially your fruit trees, you want to have those done, your berries, your grapes, roses, you got a little bit of time left. Yeah, you got some time. Uh, but you do want to get it done. So this is your definitely want to have stuff pruned by the end of the month. Yeah, so shade fruit trees before they go into bloom, because when they go into bloom, you don't want to touch them to freak them out. Otherwise, they'll drop everything. So Plus kind of lose all the pretty blooms. Yeah, true. <laughs> so do it now. Um, so that's the first thing, pruning. Get it done. The you second thing. Up. I would say with that. <laughs> yes, start, go ahead. Is you're, make sure you're cleaning me. up, too. So a lot of times in the you know, winter has been here. We've had the snow. There's a lot of leaf litter, uh, just stuff hanging mm -hmm. around your plants. It's a good time to kind of get that old leaf litter out of there for two reasons. One is a lot of fungus uh, mm -hmm. spores and things can hang out in that leaf litter. Second is a lot of insect, aphid eggs, things like that can hang out in that leaf litter. So it's a really good time to clean up as well and kind of start fresh for the season. Yeah. So it's been so incredibly moist. I've had noticed a lot more people coming in with a, a fungal issue, black spot, mildew, things like that. So, anything else on this before I'm leaving? Yeah. Yeah. So your roses, yeah, March is the time to prune your roses. You want to leave yourself three to five really good canes, nice healthy canes, not the gray or the brown ones. You want the nice green ones. And I usually cut it back to about, for me, about knee high. So maybe a foot and a half, two, two feet. feet. Uh, you don't want to go way, way back. But you want to just really get it, you want it open so they have good airflow because roses and fungus, so powdery mildew, that kind of stuff tend to go together. So if you open them up so they have good airflow, you, you reduce that incidence of, of fungal issues on your roses. Yes. Um, if you feel like you didn't have a lot of problems last year, if you didn't have powdery mildew, black spot, things like that, I, I would probably be okay with it. If you had a lot of fungal issues, I would probably not put it in my compost. Right. I think you're, you're, if you're doing your compost correctly, yeah, you'll, the bugs will take care of themselves because they'll get toasty in there. That's it's okay. Fine. You can still cut them. Yeah. yeah. Don't yeah. grow new ones. You got plenty of time in the season for you roses. Do. Yeah. Okay. Next thing, we'll talk answer questions at the end until we'll leave some more time in case you come up with more. Uh, the second thing is to put down your your pre-emergent now. I don't know if you noticed those weeds are coming up and they're starting to to grow real fast with this wet we've had. Um, and it's too late to do this if they've already sent off their seed. So you have to do this in March before April hits and they send off their seed to then regerminate and stuff. So this stops the germination process. It won't get rid of the ones that are already out, but it'll stop your germination process. And so this is the time to do it now in October, right? It's again, uh, twice yes, a year. And the end of June. End of June. So you get two seasons of weeds here. We get cool season and we get warm season. Cool so season will be coming up really quick that's your foxtail <laughs> things like that foxtails are nasty poor hounds poor hounds so you get the cool season stuff that'll especially with this moisture we've had we are going to have a i think a <laughs> bumper crop of weeds yeah. this spring this definitely definitely helps if you put it down at the end of june um that helps with your warm season your the puncture vine and all those goat heads, goat heads. things like that so I use it twice a year in our yard. 
Um, and I very rarely have to go out and pull a weed or spray a weed. Sure. If I use it religiously, it, the yard is so much more easy to maintain without all the weeds in there. Uh, it's a granular, you're spreading it out. Typically you wanna, you got a couple of weeks or so, but you yeah. wanna, the grounds are pretty moist. So it wouldn't take a lot, but it does need to be watered in to be activated because it needs to be in that first few inches of soil. So you don't want it just laying on top. But like I said, the soils are pretty moist, so it really wouldn't take a lot to get it activated at this True. point. Uh, don't use it where you want to put vegetable seeds at all or where you want to maybe put wildflower seeds because it does prevent germination on any seed. It doesn't know if it's <laughs> a weed or a flower. Okay? Yeah, <laughs> it's not everything. Once it's watered in it's and fine. that you're fine. I have two dogs. I've used it in my yard and have not ever had a problem. Yeah, so don't use, it is very good. And even if you have the weed fabric, you still get weeds. You can still use this. It will still go through the weed fabric just to help out. Right I didn't, for those gravel driveways. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, anything like that. I fought this for like two years. And every year I just go through my yard and pull up weeds and I, I regretted everything. So I used this and I was like, <laughs> I was stupid. Why didn't I do that? So and I worked here, so use it. <laughs> Um, so that's weeds. Next on the list is aphids. They are going to start coming out. As soon as we get more consistent warm weather, they're going to come out. I've already seen them in people's greenhouses, starting to get on their vegetables, that new growth on things. They are attacking. Um, you'll start to see honeydew on beneath your trees, especially I think aspens are kind of the first ones you'll see them on. Um, that and probably like KB plums. I'm getting there. Oh, okay. <laughs> Honeydew is aphid poop is what it is. So they'll secrete it. It goes on your rocks, looks very shiny. You're like, it's sticky. You're like, what is this? And it's aphid poop. So that's how you know you got aphids. If you also see ants, ants going up and down a tree, they have a symbiotic relationship. So they'll feed off each other. So the ants eat the aphid poop and all of that. So you'll get a twofer. You take care of the aphids. Yeah. <laughs> it's a weird thing. Yeah. Yeah, definitely want to. And the other thing you'll see coming out uh, is thrip sometimes called no seams. Uh, and they're they're just a itty bitty, teeny tiny. When you sit outside, it looks like little dust flying around maybe. Those are thrip. Uh, they love certain plants. So they love uh, their ornamental pears. They absolutely love those. They get into some of the plums, uh, peaches. What they, peaches, fruit a lot trees. of your fruit. And what they do is they get in there and they start sucking the juice out of the leaves and the leaves will start to curl. Uh, actually, when they're in leaf bud, they'll go down into the bud. Uh, so when the leaf goes to open, it's like real mottled, sometimes black around the edges. They love roses as well. Um, so just be aware of that. The best spray that we have for that actually is well, you can use Which this one. one Which one are you talking about? I was going to go for triple action. Ah, I probably didn't see that. <laughs> So this is a horticultural oil. This is a great cool season spray. You can use it up until temperatures reach about 75. Then you don't want to use this anymore. That's when you switch to your uh, triple action. So this is an organic spray. Okay. It's neem oil and- um, Show it to the online folks. Pyrethrums. <laughs> what? Gotta show it to the online oh. folks. <laughs> uh, so this kind of just coats the insects kind of suffocates them, coats them. It also has a repellent action to it. So they don't like the odor, uh, the smell, so they just kind of stay away from it. So uh, this is a good one to spray for your thrip and your aphids. Uh, if you want to stay organic, if you don't care, <laughs> Here, I'll take this. Sayonara is a great uh, kind of all-purpose spray. Works well on the thrip, works well on the aphids. Uh, it also works on other insects that will come later in the season, grasshoppers, mm -hmm. your beetles. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's a really here. good spray. It's a synthetic form of chromethrin, uh, but it's a good spray to you. I always say just kind of keep it in your arsenal because you never know, like when the blister beetles hit, you guys ever had blister beetles? They come in and they just, they'll just wipe out an area. And if you don't get on them right away, you will lose mm -hmm. all your foliage. So this is kind of one of those keeping your arsenal kind of things, because it's good for the beetles, the, the meaner, tougher insects, whereas your triple action, 
Great spray for soft-bodied insects, not for hard-bodied insects. Dainty, guys. Yeah. Dainty insects. <laughs> this goes a long way, too. It is very mm -hmm. concentrated. So one bottle will, will take you a long way. So uh, just so you know where you're paying for the price and you're getting a good product for this. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have it in a hose and sprayer as well because this one you need a pump sprayer or hose and sprayer, but I have a ready-to-spray that you attach to your hose. So making it easy on you folks. Okay, so that is that is insects, and that is aphids. We have another classes on like getting more in depth, but we're just kind of staying generic right now. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that. Next on the list, the spring to-do list, is you've got fertilize. And I talked about this last class and before, but it's very important. So fertilize, you have to use, which I don't, yeah, here we go. We've got, if you have a lot of fruit trees, a lot of fruiting stuff, you want the, <laughs> they look like the same thing, the fruit and vegetable. So that it has the extra calcium to get your fruit bigger, <laughs> sweeter, tasting better for you. Um, and we don't have any calcium here, so this is why this is great for fruit and vegetable. If you have other things in your yard, you can still use this if you if you have a lot of it left. It's still fine for like trees or shrubs and things. Now, if you and don't all organic, yeah, all organic. Your it's dogs totally will love it. You want to make sure you put it away and stuff and you water it in. Once it's watered in, the dogs don't have a problem. They don't really find it. Our dogs don't eat it once it's in. What? Can they still? Yeah. Deck it up. Still go for it. There are some dogs are some dogs are very attracted to it. Yeah. We used to have a black lab, Vincent, my black lab. He would hunt it down. Yeah. Uh, my other dogs, they could care less. So if you do have dogs, be aware. Don't leave the bag laying around. Yeah. They will help themselves to it. And too much of anything is bad. So don't leave it out where pests, dogs, not pests, pets <laughs> can get into it. But the, the fruit and veggie, like you said, is great. Uh, especially if you're, even if you're doing raised beds and you're going to be putting in your uh, warm season veggies or you're doing cool season veggies now this is a great product to use it's slow release so it's not going to burn so it releases over time so the plants can actually draw up the nutrients it's not going to dump a bunch all at once where the plant can't use it and most of it just gets washed away down into the streams and you know where we don't want it uh, this allows it stays around for the plant to use it and pull it up there are chairs over there if you need some in the back. Yeah, there are a couple more chairs. Um, one thing on the synthetics, since you brought it up, um, the liquid synthetics are things like that, the liquid fertilizers. And I said this last week, so you'll, I'll be repeating myself, but um, it is they run out really fast here. So you spend a lot of money on them, but because we have to water so much, we're very dry, they tend to run out of our system very fast, and they can they have the potential to get into your water system and your things like that. So we suggest moving away from them, um, the other thing is they move so fast because we have no soil here. We've got clay and we've got rock. So we don't have that extra topsail that like California has or the Midwest has to help mitigate that. It just runs right through. Um, so that's why we moved, we created the fertilizer. It's why we kind of brought it for that slow re release. So you're not losing a lot of it and the plant can take up more. So I just kind of wanted to throw that out there. And um, sometimes those synthetics can burn your soil because we don't have a lot of it. So you'll, they'll kill your earthworms. They'll make your plant great but it kills your soil, which we already have horrible soil. So keep that in mind. I'm not gonna dissuade you or whatever. I just wanted to throw it out there to help you guys do well here. Arizona is very challenging <laughs> to grow. So can we hit on soil sulfur yeah. while we're... So soil sulfur is not really a fertilizer. It's a soil amendment. Uh, so we're very alkaline here. Our soils are alkaline, our water is alkaline. So we don't need lime. If, you, if you've moved from the East Coast, the South, you guys all use lime all the time. We never, I don't even sell soil lime sulfur. because it's just yeah. not needed here. But the soil sulfur, there you go. <laughs> soil sulfur uh, allows our soil to become more acidic, which is what we want because we're very alkaline, our water is alkaline, so we're trying to combat that. Soil sulfur, you kind of just mix in around your plants. It's a once a year treatment. Spring would be an excellent time to do it um, and just kind of just go, I'm just doing it once, especially for things that have color. So your um, things that you want fall color for, your maples, things like that, that you really want to bring out the color. Soil sulfur helps bring out the color. So it's a really good additive to use. A little bit goes a long way. 
Uh, but it really does make a difference and I really encourage people. It's a once a year thing and it makes a big difference. So it's worth doing, definitely. All your plants, trees, shrubs, evergreens, deciduous trees, all of those will benefit from using the soil sulfur. You could do them at the same time. It's not going to matter. It's a small. It's a, it, not very much. So the directions are very obtuse. <laughs> yeah, that's not helpful. Uh, and the thing is, you're not going to burn with it. Uh, but usually, like on a shrub or so, I'll use a quarter cup. Uh, if it's a bigger tree, I'd probably use more than that. Uh, mix it with your fertilizer or any of that. It'll be fine. Um, the other thing I'll just hit on briefly. So <laughs> aluminum sulfate, there again is a once a year additive. This is for say your uh, blue spruce, uh, your, if you do hydrangeas, things like that. This encourages the color in the blue spruce, your Wichita blues, uh, things that kind of have that bluish color to it. It just really helps it bring out that blue. Yeah. So it's not for everything in your yard, but for some specific items, it's a great product. Once a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I think we beat up fertilizer. Well, you too, yeah. The all purpose, or? Oh, I can. See, so you, you skip some steps here, but oh. it's fine. Um, this is, I mean, we, this is the same thing. It just doesn't have the calcium in it. So it doesn't for, for this is for everything else in your yard. That's not a fruit. It also has uh, has a little bit of iron in it, and it also has some Sul soil sulfur in it as well. Yeah. Uh, so these are made with cottonseed meal, guanos, that kind of stuff. So it also helps bring up that acidity. Yeah. So using it with the soil sulfur is perfect. Any questions on that before we move on? The next step. Yeah? Okay. So the next one. Is she already talked about the soil sulfur things like that? So we already <laughs> went into that. I'm so sorry, that's your next step. <laughs> You're good. Um, so I say we got we got time for a fun tidbit. I like I like this because Ken put it in his talk a couple of years ago, but it's like a fun fact for history here. So you you know we're surrounded by all those volcanoes, old Thumb View, Granite Mountain, I mean Flagstaff, all volcanoes. So all that ash has settled into our ground system. So when you pull up water from your well, well water, city water, things like that, mostly well water, it pulls up through the ash, which makes it alkaline. That is why we are very alkaline. You don't find that very many other places, maybe other states, but because of our volcanoes and pulling up the water, it creates the alkalinity. That is why we are so high. So I thought that was fun. I thought okay. I would share it. I don't know. Okay. Very true. So the next one, since we're moving on, is to chop, pop dress your flowers and your vegetable beds. Um, the, you kind of probably already did it. It's kind of the time to do it. February and March is about that time as you're going to go plant vegetables. As you can tell, we've got some. We've got the cool weather vegetables. That is your broccoli, your cauliflower, cabbage, kale, things like that. That They can handle the cold now. You can plant them now. They'll do better for you. The cold weather actually makes the taste come out more, which is why you don't want to wait on these guys. You want to plant them now. Because if you wait when you're... The warm and stuff, they taste more bitter. They don't get that sweetness that people love. So that's why I'm plant them now. Plus, if, if you're planting when they're too, if it's too warm, they'll go to seed. So yeah, they the send bolts. up a seed head. And once that, you can pinch that out, but it does tend to make them more bitter. And it also stops them from putting out more leaves. So now is a really good time to get them into your, your raised beds, your containers, whichever you want. Uh, we've got bunch of different kinds of lettuces. We've got kale, uh, spinach is a great one. We've got onions. What else do we have in? A lot of different <laughs> herbs. Things like that. Yeah, herbs. Yes. If you're going to go from seed, now would be the time to get them. Yeah, you're right. almost a little late. You got to yeah. do it. <laughs> uh, you can put in your cool season herbs, those herbs that don't mind being cold. They're actually perennial for here. Oregano. Is definitely one. It's not uh, lavender. <laughs> that's lavender. We've got rosemary. We've got sage. Uh, trying to think what else. The mints. You can definitely put your mints in now. So if you want to get those those herbs in that don't mind the cool seasons, now is a great time to put them out. Um, and your veggies. And the other thing with veggies, people think I'm kind of weird, but. <laughs> 
I love mixing my cool season annuals in with my veggies. I think it looks really pretty. So this is Swiss chard, has that beautiful Swiss chard. This particular one is bright lights. So it'll do the kind of the red and the green stems on it, but just really pretty to mix in with your pansies. And pansies are edible. Did you guys know pansies and violas are both uh, edible? Violas. You can throw them in your These salads if you want. <laughs> but just a really, if you're doing containers, it's a really easy way to throw some veggies in there and get those along with your pretty flowers. Yeah. Snapdragons is another cool season flower. If you have javelina, deer, bunnies, mm -hmm. snapdragons are an excellent color spring flower for you because they don't like them. They will eat your pansies all day long. So if you have pansies and violas out and you have javelina, it's gone. <laughs> Just they got into my yard. I thought I was doing so good. I'm like, they haven't been here. I'm good. Went out one morning and there's nothing left. <laughs> it's massacred <laughs> all over. <laughs> so take my advice. Just don't if you have javelina. We do have some hanging baskets of pansies, cool wave pansies. Beautiful. And I will bring one of those home and I'll hang it. I think I do it just to taunt them. You know, you're like, yeah, there's some pansies you can't get to. So just be careful of what you're putting in uh, if you have critters. So this is Dianthus. It's another cool season flower that is animal resistant. Uh, and this one will bloom all through the season for you. Dianthus is a is an amazing plant that's kind of underutilized. Yeah. Uh, smells good, blooms all through the season, comes in whites and pinks and reds. Uh, definitely one to look for to put in your containers or raised beds or wherever you want. <laughs> Take some plants out of your hands. I'll hit a, since I'm talking. Jeez, these are all flowers, might as well. <laughs> so these are your um, poppies. The, they're strictly a, an ornamental poppy. They're again, they like the cool season. Yeah, for each the um, Really See pretty, you kind of get that yellow and the orange colors. Usually there's a pink one that comes out of it too. Don't look so, at that. <laughs> it's you're dropping my <laughs> uh, Rather, you know, loves the cool season. It's going to kind of peter out when we get hot. But hey, we need some color in our lives right now. Something yeah. besides white snow and dirt <laughs> mud. Uh, they're wonderful to put in. This one. Let me cover this one. Might as well. <laughs> Last one. So we'll this is Columbine. Uh, a columbine is a really pretty little wildflower for here. It will reseed and come back up in your yard again. It likes the cool seasons. Uh, right now I just have yellow, but it also comes in pink and blue. Uh, we'll be getting a ton of these in. Just a really cool little spot. We've got really nice under trees. If you've got like your junipers and things like that out in your yard, really nicely goes under those. And like I said, it'll recede and keep coming back. Pretty animal resistant. So it's a nice one. Okay, last thing, and we'll move on to the next thing on the list. Um, so if you haven't, I'll get you right after a sec. Otherwise I'll forget my thought, I'm bad at that. Um, so the ground, if you haven't noticed, is heating and all of that. So it, as we're freezing, it freezes and then we dry, it like expands on itself. So you're getting some heaving. Uh, you might see that in your vegetables or your flower beds. That's kind of why you want to prepare. Now you do not have to do as much as like Midwest. You know, you can throw down some straw, but mostly you need like the mulch and manure mix. Um, this should have been done like I would say a couple weeks ago, but you can still do it now if you're willing to have some time in your vegetable beds to not plant. So the mulch and the manure, which they don't have unfortunately, uh, you mix it together and it is very hot. So you want to throw it out in your vegetable bed. It kind of creates a cover heats up that soil and keeps it from heaving but you can't plant in it because it's so hot so you got to give it three to four weeks or so about um, to cool it off and then you can plant straight into it it's good stuff for your vegetable beds it's not going to overwhelm it um, if you want to just use potting soil you can but this just helps with the heaving of your soil to keep it more compact and maintained because um, if you heave too much it rips up roots it can rip up just hurt your your flowers and things like that so you want to protect a little bit. You don't have to do as much as you would normally. You can do less. You want to do that. I'm going to answer her first. I'm going to get to yeah. you. Do you guys have questions? You have questions. Sorry. I'm used to you guys asking. Yep, that, yep. That, if you have straw, you can use it, but that's just lighter and easier on the plants. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Yep. No, no. Seed, it actually likes, so you need a thin layer, but it helps keep the moisture in to germinate, and it helps the birds not take it away or the wind take it away. So it's, it's good to use now. Yeah. So one quick point, just because you mentioned wildflowers. If you want to put wildflower seed out, now is a really good time to do it because if you wait too much past March, it's almost too late. You're not going to get that really good germination. A lot of wildflower seed wants that freeze thaw to crack the hull. So if you're thinking about doing it, now is the time to do it. And you do cover it with the mulch, but just make sure you use it a very fine layer yeah. when you cover it. You don't want it too thick on there or you won't get good germination again. Um, the other thing about the mulch, if you, like I said, clean up, clean up that leaf matter. If you want to put some fresh, the mulch makes a really good topping to put down after you've kind of cleaned all that leaf matter up. Yeah. Okay, so next on the list, moving on, moving forward. <laughs> so pine scale, bark beetle, they're going to start coming out. And I, I don't know if it'll be a good year for them or not because it's been so cold, but they always hit here. And they always go for weak things first. And then they'll move on to healthy things. So, and they get so pine scale gets on your pinion pines, sometimes on your ponderosas, but they love pinion pine. Uh, the bark beetle gets into your ponderosas. Uh, you can also get ips beetle in like your Arizona cypress, uh, other cypress, junipers, that kind of thing. Yeah, so they're, they're coming out. Um, so, this is what you want to use this is a systemic, it's called tree and shrub drench for you guys. It's a liquid, you mix it with water, and it tells you how much per tree, because for those big guys, you're using like a whole bottle, those ponderosas, things like that, whole bottle. But you mix it with water, and you're going to pour it straight onto the bark or right around the base. It's counterintuitive. You think you'd want to put it up by the feeder roots, but it goes up the bark, the cambium layer, I believe, right? Yeah. So you want to put it right there, pour it right onto it. And your shrubs and things, you can use it on your shrubs. It doesn't really, does not need for that specifically, but you can use it. We, we yeah you can I'll we you sell it more for your pine trees, trees. evergreen so, um, things like that right it's an excellent product it's once a year there yeah. again once a year treatment great preventative if you have if if you're in the areas where you have big ponderosas and beautiful pinion pines and you want to keep them healthy this is an excellent product for that uh, use it once a year. You want to use it this time. It's perfect time of year to do it because they're starting to wake up. Yeah. And they're going to start pulling up that sap. So as they pull up the sap, they're going to take the product right with them and go out into the needles. And then as the scale or the boar uh, land and want to start eating, it just takes them right out. Yeah. So scale, um, I haven't seen any yet, but I think it's because we've been cold. Yeah. But keep an eye out for the pine scale. It'll look like alien sacks of goo with little specks in it. it. And you come in, you're <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> well, those are all the scale. And they're going to hatch out of there and they're going to immediately climb up your trees, go out to your needles and they attach. And they attach there and they start sucking the juice out. And then they kind of harden off. So mm -hmm. when they first come out, they're light green. And then they attach and they kind of turn a brown or black. And once they're attached and they, they've hardened off, made a scale, a uh, armor on them, they're almost impossible to spray. Yeah, this won't work. Because they protect themselves with that scale, that yeah. armor. Whereas if you know, you're know you treating them with that, they're going to eat on it, it kills them that way. So yeah. you're not trying to spray. But keep an eye out for those sacks. If you see them, try to get them up, get them in a bag, get them in your trash. Don't put them in your recycle. Don't put them out anywhere else. You want to get rid of them. It's about like so. It'll just be like a gooey. You don't see it as much. You'll yeah. mostly see them once they get into scale form. But if you see them around the early. base of the tree or sometimes in the crotches of the trees, uh, it's just something to keep an eye out for. If you can get rid of it before they hatch, it's great. Yeah. Sometimes you don't. But using the drench will definitely help with that. Do you have a question? Right. So usually if it's a peach tree borer, uh, the cherries get a wasp that lay the eggs and the larvae burrow into underneath that trunk, the 
bark, and they're eating the cambium layer, the growing layer of the tree. So yeah, it's a challenge to get rid of those guys. There's a couple ways to do it. Uh, one is once you start seeing that sap, so they go into the tree, the tree starts sapping because it goes, I want to get rid of this insect. I'm trying to push it out. So once you see that sapping, you can kind of wipe it away. You can spray it with uh, sayonara. Uh, you can also get like a paper clip and dip it in the sayonara, find the hole, and just kind of poke in there. Those are for boars. And she's for talking boars. about mostly on fruit trees. The yeah. peaches get it a lot. Those pitted fruits can get it more, right. but they can show up on different trees, but mm -hmm. just talking mostly fruit trees. So that's one way to do it. Uh, you know, you gotta be on it. You gotta be paying attention to the trees in your yard and get on it as soon as you start seeing that sap flow. Uh, usually with peach trees, it's towards, and with the cherries, it's towards the base. So if you're cleaning up around that tree, you might just see it, real orange gooey sap coming out. Definitely wanna get on that. Uh, you can use the tree and shrub drench. You can use it uh, on certain fruit trees, yeah. not every fruit tree. Uh, so you have to be careful. So on certain fruit trees, it won't cross over into the barrier of the fruit and you can still eat your fruit and be fine. Um, there, yeah. we can talk about, if you have more questions on it, talk to me about it later, because some people do have concerns about it. Yeah. Uh, because your trees will be blooming and the bees and that kind of stuff. So if, if you're thinking about that, talk to me later. I don't want to go into a big, long thing here. We'll be here all afternoon. <laughs> uh, but it can be used. Yeah. You know? And sometimes it's a question of save the tree or not save the tree. So it just depends how bad it is yeah. in there. Yep. Okay. So that's kind of it. I mean, we the next step is on vegetables. We already kind of went over that and when to do them and, and all that. And the next one's plant. Plant now. March is a great time to plant. It's cool enough to plant, but your, your soil is it's easier to dig in, and we don't freeze as much at night. It's, it's less freezing temps and more like the 20s, those 30s. They're warmer, <laughs> warmer. Uh, so plants can handle it. And, they, and when they want to wake up in, in their home, they don't want to wake up in buckets. They want to wake up in their ground, and they'll do better for you than planting in April and May. You can plant year-round here. There's not a problem with that. Certain times are easier than others. So March is a great time to get things in. Can I hit on one more product yeah. before we go into planting? Just because uh, we were talking about fungus earlier on roses, uh, aspens, certain trees around here get fungus, the powdery mildew, black spot, a uh, few others that just kind of show up, the anthracnose kind of show up consistently in your trees. Aspens, birch, those kind of very common in them. If you've had problems in the past, last summer, last, you know, we had a pretty wet monsoon season. Mm -hmm. If you've got some of that fungal showing up in your trees, I recommend using the fungicide in the spring. So you want to use it when those buds are swollen and they're about ready to pop. This is a great time to do your first spray of a fungicide. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> So this like, is actually an organic fungicide. I love this one because you can spray it, but you can also mix it up and use it as a drench around the tree. Mm -hmm. So it just makes it super easy to use. So if you fungicide have five. fungal issues, it's not a once and done, unfortunately. Yeah. You're gonna always kind of be working to keep that fungus under control. You will probably never totally eradicate it uh, depending upon the type of fungus, if it's, if it's powdery mildew, that kind of stuff, you can usually yeah. get a good handle on it. Some of the other ones are a little more stubborn in your trees and they just hang out there. Uh, but spring, as like I said, as those buds swell, it's a great time to use your fungicide. And this is a nice organic, yeah. that's why I like it, easy to use. Uh, we have it, that's a concentrate. We also have one you- to Attach to your hose. Your hose? Yeah. yeah. So just keep that in mind if you've had problems in the past. Definitely want to keep an eye on it for this year. Yeah. Okay. We will go into some of our plants. We are saying spring is here. We had two big trucks show up this week. Took oh us God. three days to get it done. You and saw still the lower put greenhouse. It away. So if you walked up down by the lower greenhouse, oh my gosh. Yeah. We're, it's we're, fun wow. trucks. Yeah, yeah. So we're excited. That means our season is going to hit. I'm bored. I'm ready to do things. So we just thought we'd show you some of that new stuff that came off because uh, we're excited about it. The first one, as you all probably noticed first, Mountain Heath. Beautiful, we have this in purple and white and two different sizes, one gallons and threes. Heath, oh, sorry, Heath, what did I say? You said Heath, I oh, said okay. pink. 
Oh, pink, <laughs> pink, white, purple, whatever. <laughs> um, and we only get it this time of year. So once we're out, we're out. Um, why don't you talk more on it? I'm, so it's, it's one of me. those kind of more early spring bloomers, which is really nice. It gives you color <laughs> out in the yard early on. Animal resistant. So if you have those critters in your yard, they don't really care for it. Blooms a very extended period of time. Long, yeah. uh, it's not a continual bloomer, but it's a very long blooming plant. Uh, when it's done blooming, I actually like the foliage. It's considered evergreen. It has like a real ferny kind of foliage to it. Uh, it can take full sun. It can take a spot where it gets some shade. It's very adaptable. Yeah. Uh, it's probably going to get two to three feet tall, probably about three feet wide. I have seen them wider. I had a customer who brought me in a picture of hers. <laughs> It had to have been five feet wide. Wow. It was gorgeous. Uh, like she said, it comes in the white and the pink. Just a really nice uh, little spring plant for here. And she's right, when we get them one time a year. So if you miss it, don't come talk to me in May <laughs> while I'm in the heat, because I'm not going to have it. Yeah, it's like the camellias. We only get them once a year. So right. when you do the gardenias. So two types of gardenias. These are more of a shade plant. They grow in that they can't do the afternoon shade, morning sun, late evening sun. They get a pretty white flower that is very smell and fragrance. It is, you get it for the fragrance. Um, mm -hmm. The two different types, one shorter, one's got, I would say more, it's not the same fragrance, but different flower. The, yeah, the fragrance type. is very much the same. The, this one I think is sweet tea. So sweet tea has that sweet tea. <laughs> sweet tea. <laughs> sweet. Tea has that more traditional gardenia blossom that if you're from California, the South, uh, nice full kind of double blossom. Uh, very fragrant. This one I have in my yard. I have it in a container and has done very well in a container. The other thing I've learned um, is it actually, I always thought it needed a lot of shade, but I've grown it in my front area in a pot. That's true. And it gets a lot of sun and oh. actually does very well. So I wouldn't be afraid if you've got a sunnier spot. It's hot there because I have brick. Yeah, she's got it right up against her house. So, yeah. so I think it's more adaptable than we sometimes think, think it is. It is. Uh, and the other one, I think a sweet star. Yeah. It has more of a simple blossom to it. It's not the big double blossom, but they both do very well. And I, it kind of blooms all through the season yeah. and actually into early fall up until we get a frost. It's evergreen. Uh, so just a nice little plant in the ground or in containers would do very yeah. well. You might notice in the, go ahead. So her question was, would it do well in total shade? The only thing I've noticed in total shade is I tend to overwater it. Yeah. <laughs> so, cause it's got a real waxy leaf to it. So if you have it in total shade, I would just say, watch your watering and don't overwater. Do you notice the difference in bloom? Gloom um, coming out or no? Well, I okay. don't. It's always a thing. Yeah. And that you can both. Uh, you can, but we'll try. Mostly we stop in like April. We run out. We can't get yeah, it I would in. I by May. By May. Kind of, yeah, we're yeah. kind of done. Yeah. The animals? Um, I don't think they You know it. what? The javelina and the bunnies have never touched it in my front yeah. yard. And they go through. They'll rip out my yeah, pansies, right? like I said. But they've I'm never the bothered day. my gardenia. We got, he's got a question there. Oh, two. Uh, I'd say about three by three, three. three. Same with the other one. The other one might be a little bit bigger. Or is it the same? Yeah, they're about the same. Same three by three. You got to watch when you put those in. You got to make the same. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They do not like that moisture as much, and you'll notice in winter, hers kind of does it. Gets chlorotic. It lose. It gets yellow. But that's just kind of the winter color. It's not watering per se, but it's nutrients and and all of that. So just but yeah, it can go kind of yellow, but it will go back to green. Yeah, a gardenia. The what? Like the deer and all that. I still don't think that the, the babies might try it, but it's got like a taste that the animals don't really like. They don't want to munch on it. Oh, that we've noticed. You always get javelina, we'll eat anything. Doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, so this one is Lily of the Valley shrub, also known as Pieris. This is more of a shade plant, or it could be a filtered light. Another good one for under plantings, under trees, east side of your house where it's getting morning sun, afternoon shade. Uh, just a pretty little one. This one is the something silver. 
streaming something flaming silver flaming, flaming silver so it's a variegated one we also have one that's called mountain fire which is the new growth comes out uh, like a red and then it has really nice fall red color on it as well these are, are the blossoms so it blooms in the spring the blossoms look like a lily of the valley hence the name of the shrub uh, bloom there again it blooms quite a long time nice little shrub for here uh, it's another one don't overwater it uh, they tend to rot pretty easily if you get too much water on them so that's something to be aware of for these guys that's what i wanted to show last week because we have those little ones and i um, wanted to show this because it's way prettier it uh, is prettier. and it's shade shade plant yeah does it smell like the lily of the it does have a fragrance not as strong as yeah, the lily of the not as strong unfortunately but it's so pretty when it's in bloom in the shady spot it's tough <laughs> What shade? What are we talking about? <laughs> this let's talk about fragrance. This is a Daphne. This is that ever everlasting eternal, eternal. fragrance Daphne. Now we had trouble getting these last year. It doesn't seem like we have trouble this year. Uh, shade pram, but very very fragrant. They get that white flower on them when they open, um, and then they just they just smell. So and again, I don't think any animals. I've touch never had animals touch these. It is evergreen like. as well. Nice evergreen does need shade. Yeah, I can show the online class this. Uh, They're cut flower. You guys probably you can't really, really see it. <laughs> this is so fragrant. It's crazy. Yeah, it's amazing. Really, really, really uh, I think it's about four by four would be nice. Yeah. You want to do blueberry now? Yeah. So we'll talk about blueberries. Oh, those we these we have year round, but Blueberries, I think they're just a really pretty plant as well as getting the berry off of them. Uh, the blooms on them are kind of a whitish pink blossom, just really pretty when it blooms. You will get blueberries. I always tell people it's probably you're not going to be canning blueberries. <laughs> We're not in the right climate for it. Yeah. But I love to go out and just nibble on a few while I'm out there. If you like your birds, uh, great for the birds. So it's wonderful for that. Always going to get better production when you plant two different varieties. Yeah. They do great in containers. If you want to grow them in containers, they do wonderful in that because they do like the acidity. So you got to kind of make sure you're always keeping that acid level up for these guys to do well. Um, and some of them, not all of them, but some of them will give you really nice fall color as well. You get kind of pinks and purples off the fall color. That sherbet one gives mm -hmm. you a nice fall yeah. color, peach, peach color. I would say in the heat of summer, it's June, there's no cloud <laughs> cover, it's 100 degrees. They're going to do better where they probably get some filtered light or afternoon shade. I wouldn't put it out in that full hot sun, especially in the summer. Yeah. But they take our cold amazingly well. So kind of, let's do some questions you guys want, because I did speak on the rest of the stuff last week. Your hair. Hey, my hair. <laughs> Maybe my hair. <laughs> Flip it back. Um, we can talk on these if you want, but I just wanted to open it for questions since we got about 10 minutes or so. Uh, just anyone? 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 <laughs> uh, you can harshly cut that thing. I mean, I cut mine in half, if not more. I would say what like not even a foot you could do more it just depends i usually leave mine a little longer depends on how that's just old me, it is as well you know? okay so I maybe not as harsh but half of it or so if they're older you can always do harley ken he cut he cuts it down like like almost to the ground maybe a foot off but uh so it depends on the age but your, i guess so your russian said, stage you can cut way back Oh, the salvia gregii is the one have the red flowers and stuff on it. I don't do as harsh, but she's right. Handy. Can do it harsh. She <laughs> comes through and cuts her way back. And I'm like, oh. You know, so we always fight about that. But, you know, <laughs> you want to, trimming them back is good because yeah. it keeps that fresh wood, which gives you the better blooms. They don't get real brittle and old looking. It's kind of scraggly. So keeping them pruned back is, is you do want to prune. At least half. At least half. There you go. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. It's up to you. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of been a rough we winter, so you may see some little bit of dieback on the tips. And if you, or if you just need to shape it, if it's just gotten way out of control, uh, it would be a good time to do it. I wouldn't do it all the way back, yeah. but I would just shape it or trim off any winter burn. Kind of the tops and sides. Same with lavender, works same way with lavender. Yeah. We'll get you next. Go ahead. 
Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you have it in the ground, I would use the soil sulfur. If you have it in a container, I probably wouldn't use it in a container. But I would use it in this in if it was planted in the soil in the ground. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we, you know, we cover a broad area, everywhere yeah. down to Cordis Lakes, up to Williams, all of that. Um, technically, yes, you can plant year round. I agree with you. Uh, June is probably my least favorite month, but I've planted in June. Depends on what I'm doing. If I'm doing container gardens, that kind of stuff, yeah. If I was going to plant a blue spruce, I might wait. You know, we How always want to give our go? yeah. <laughs> you want to give your plants the best start possible, and that means starting with healthy plants and then planting them at, at their most successful time. So spring is a really good time to plant, especially your dormant things because you get them in their new home. They wake up and they start singing and they're happy. They don't realize, oh, I, I'm in a new spot. Um, fall is another really good time to plant. But yeah, if you, it depends on how much you want to push it. Yeah. But I agree. The hotter it is, the more of a challenge it is. Right. I mean, yeah, it's just, it's not fun, but you can still do it if oh, you want to get things in. Oh, it's in goodness. my pocket and I keep hitting my pocket. It's in mine too. Sorry. <laughs> so yeah, so answer your questions. Anyone else? So with, yeah, wisterias, well, if you, if they have buds on them, don't prune them. Uh, I would definitely, maybe next year or after they're done blooming, you could trim them back. Definitely want to fertilize those guys. Um, and they, you know, they, especially if you want them to bloom, I might add some more um, like superphosphate or bone meal in there because that will encourage your blooms on them. Uh, but if they haven't been pruned in a while, it would definitely benefit them. But I would probably wait till they're done blooming this season, and then I would cut them back. Because you they're pretty new. I don't think they're going to have to stay Yeah, so they're just young guys, too. So we always say here, the first year you plant, they sleep. The second year, they creep. And the third year, they leap. So, nice. you know, in, in our area, you got to have some patience with yeah. your plants. Um, and you may need to baby them a little more to begin with to really get them rooted out, get them going. Uh, so you got to have some patience. So I always tell people, be patient. With them. Uh, but if they're fairly young, they probably don't need a lot of pruning, maybe just some shaping, trimming. But that fertilizing would be very important, that all-purpose plant food four times a year make a huge difference for you. Yeah, and that's the same. If you have things that are older and still, they're like not producing as many flowers or they're not growing as fast as they were, that's because, part of that reason could be because you've, you've rinsed out everything in your soil and you haven't really replaced it as much as you should. That soil sulfur, the aluminum sulfate, and the all-purpose will get it back to where it needs and you'll have a better chance of it, of it coming back and flowering for you and, and growing faster and all of that. So mm -hmm. we just lead, they, they take the nutrients and if you don't replenish it every couple of years, you're, it's out. So that helps, definitely. Yeah. Yes. Maples and aspens are creeping stage. <laughs> so you definitely want to, you know, if they're still just kind of sitting there looking at you, that's where that fertilizing is hugely important. And then correct watering. I think uh, we could probably do a whole class on watering. <laughs> yeah, we'll get too deep uh, into it. <laughs> it is a challenge to get your watering correct. Your trees, your big trees, they like good deep waterings. They don't like these little shallow waterings. Multiple frequent shallow waterings are not good for your big trees. They don't need it as frequent, but when you water them, you really want to water deeply so that they're, you're getting the entire root ball and then you're getting a little beyond that. So they want to create the roots, want to go, oh, I'm going to move out. I'm going to move out. Uh, so that's really important in your trees. Fertilizing those young trees, very important because um, you want to give them a good root base. So when we have these heavy snow loads or the winds like we've had, if you have trees that are not well rooted, do you ever see trees just... <laughs> They're like this in the yard Goodbye. and the roots are sticking out. It's because they weren't well rooted. 
Uh, you've got to have that root base to give you a nice, healthy top. So watering is tough. You guys ever have watering questions? Like I said, we could do a whole class, but come talk to us. We've got some great informational sheets on watering um, and help you get, try to get it correct. Get multiple irrigation systems. So I'll <laughs> fight that till I die, because I'm assuming a lot of it's on one system. You're feeding shrubs, flowers, trees. You will never be fully successful if it's on one system. Now, there's nothing you can do if you don't want to change that or it's already set in. But anyone doing new stuff, do multiple systems. I beg you for you. It's been great for our yard, and it's so easy once it's set up to choose your systems. Water your trees for two hours. Water your shrubs for an hour. Like, it's nice. But I understand if you don't have that, I just like to push it. My little tidbit. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yes. We got one more question. Yes. How far back on should you prune your roses? Usually you want to leave yourself a good foot and a half to two feet yeah. and uh, give yourself three to five really nice uh, younger canes. So anything that's gray or brown, prune those out of there. And you kind of want to do it vase shaped so that you get good air circulation. And I think on our website, watersgardencenter.com, under our garden tips section, there's a whole sheet on pruning roses which is a really good resource. If you guys are new in the area, hitting that website on the garden tips tab. I mean, I think we probably have how many? <laughs> oh, so many. Yeah. Everything Resilient. Ken's written, yeah. it's on there. <laughs> so really good information for, for our local area. Okay, so we, we're gonna kind of end here. It's about our time, but I wanted to mention we were having a discount today. So this is a coupon to show it to the cashier. 15% off shrubs, vines, and any Berries? Is it berries? So berries. berries. So that so can be strawberries. We've grape. also got raspberries, blackberries, some grapes. They're kind of, these are already kind of, these would probably need some protection still if you put them out because they have this all this brand new growth. So we have a out. lot that are still very dormant that you could plant now and they would be fine. Yeah. I have searched my <laughs> life for black raspberries. I cannot. Listen find them. We usually get the blackberries, raspberries, boysenberries, marionberries. Uh, we get a fall's gold raspberry, which That's is so good. amazing. So good. Uh, but That's I have not been able to find the black raspberries. Yeah. All right. Well, that's our class. We'll stay up here and answer questions and stuff. My bad. <laughs> Sorry. And then uh, but thank you for coming and showing up, guys. Appreciate thank it. you. I'm <laughs> yes. It's in my pocket. <laughs> I'm not going to go. I know. <laughs>